Good evening, everyone, and welcome to KBC. What a privilege this is to, to join together, to worship in song together, and to share in fellowship as well. Um, we're trying a, a slightly new format if you've been here the last few weeks. Um, so we're going to kick off with a bit of, of worship to start off with, and then we'll break into a bit more time for fellowship, um, and then we'll come back for a bit of a talk. But for now, we're going to stand and we're going to praise his name. If you're a regular here at KBC, we're going to take our offering during the second song. But for now, let's stand and let's lift our song of worship to God. Let's stand. the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your words. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you God save. 
darkness we were waiting without hope without light till heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and promise to a virgin came the words from the throne of endless glory to the
bow down this evening and worship you for that. How great is your name in all the earth. Amen. Amen. As I said at the beginning, we're now going to take a short five-minute break or so. Feel free to turn to your partner, say hello, how's your week been? There's also, I believe, some sweet treats out the back if you want to go and get some more of that. And we'll return in five minutes or so where Paul will bring us God's word.
Okay, let me draw us back together. Um, if that's okay, please do continue your um, conversations um, later on. Give me some time at the end to do that as well. Um, just before I invite um, Paul up um, to share with us this evening and to, to pray for him, I just want to point out um, a wee book for you on the way out. So for those of you that were at our church conference, um, you'll know we were able to um, to sell this for a pound a copy. Absolute bargain. Um, but because of that bargain, we ran out really quickly. Um, but there are now some more. So on your way out, um, both doors, um, pop a wee pound in the bucket, copy of Pilgrim's Progress, not the 16th century text, 21st century version. Um, but still great, still really good. Highly recommend you pick up a copy of that and for anyone else that you think would enjoy it. But they're there as well. Um, but Paul, why don't you come up and um, join us this evening? Um, Paul, really quick question um, or questions. Um, give us three things that we should know about you. Or uh, we need to know. Okay. Uh, I'm Paul. I'm a Christian. That feels like a pretty important first one. Yeah. Uh, I'm married. That's probably a second important to one. To Claire. Claire, uh, good. Who, yeah. Yes, is probably watching from home. Nice. Um, hopefully. And uh, <laughs> thirdly, I'm a mechanical engineer. So. And so what was the third one? I'm a mechanical engineer. Mechanical That's my engineer. occupation. Yeah. There we go. Right, Paul, I'm going to pray for you. And then, then you can take us through our next section um, of John. All right. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Paul. We thank you for the words that you've been um, speaking to him um, in his moments of preparation with you, God. Father, we thank you that as he comes um, to use his gifting, um, to use the words that you've given him, and to share those with us this evening, Lord. We pray that we would have open hearts and minds um, to your spirit at work among us. Lord, help each of us to be open um, to what you want to say to us. Lord, help Paul to hear your voice clearly and carefully. And Lord, as we open your word together, we pray that you would be glorified in all that is said and done, Father. In your precious name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Rob. All right, so we're continuing the series through John, and we're looking at the, the run-up to Easter Sunday. This is particularly the, the four chapters where we have the the Last Supper, Jesus' final time with his 12 disciples less than 24 hours before he's going to die on the cross. So it's a very important time. It's a, a time that Jesus uses to equip his disciples for the time that he's not going to be with them. Um, the passage we're looking at in particular follows on from what Rob was talking about last week. Uh, last week, Rob introduced Jesus having this servant heart and introduced him as as washing the feet of his disciples, the, the king of kings that we were just singing about, humbling himself to, to wash his disciples' feet, and, and then said to the, at the end that they were now clean. And, and that's just important because the, the first verse of what we're going to talk about tonight actually says, well, maybe, maybe not all of them were. So we're, we're jumping in right in chapter 13, verse 18, and it's a familiar passage one that I think you'll probably be familiar with because we do revisit it every year when it comes to, to Easter and we look at the story. Even if you're not a Christian, I think there's probably a familiarity or an awareness that Judas Iscariot isn't exactly a particularly great role model. The, the name Judas is synonymous with betrayal, with treachery and being a traitor. So there will be a familiarity as we approach this passage. And, and I found when I was preparing that I was maybe so familiar that the the shock element um, for this betrayal didn't really hit me. I, I knew that Jesus was betrayed by Judas, but I looked at it more as a, a mechanism by which the story moved forward. Like Jesus had to be handed over to the authorities somehow, and the betrayal was just the, the way that happened. But, but I think it's important that we take a step back before we approach the passage and, uh, and maybe look at it like the disciples would have, would have looked at it. Uh, so the disciples weren't aware that this betrayal was coming or at least 11 of them weren't. And uh, I think that's an important mindset. That as we read this passage, let's put aside what we, we know is going to happen, put aside the fact that betrayal is, is, is something that we maybe take for granted as part of the story and, uh, and read it for, for what it is. So if you have a Bible, please do read along. This is uh, John chapter 13, starting at verse 18. I'm not referring to all of you. I know those I've chosen. 
But this is to fulfill the passage of Scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. I'm telling you now, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Very truly, I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me. And whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which one of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining against him. Simon Peter mentioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then, dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, What you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought that he was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. When he was gone, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow now? I'll lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay your life down for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Now, I struggled to find just one theme or two themes to pick out tonight from this passage. It covers a lot. There's a lot in those 20 verses, and uh, it didn't feel right to, to skim over uh, a lot of the important messages that Jesus is putting across to his disciples. So I'm also conscious that we have a 20-minute slot, and it's uh, not a lot of time. And with the new structure to the evening, the intention is that at the end, there'll be a bit of time for you to, to chat and reflect on this passage and what we've talked about, and I want to make sure there's time for that as well. So that said, uh, it's maybe going to be a bit more like spiritual tapas. You know, there's going to be five main points that we're going to go through. Uh, not quite a main meal, but hopefully there'll still be enough nourishment in that. Uh, so yeah, we'll look at them in five different sections, which seem to me logical to, to break it into. The first betrayal foretold, the, the prediction that Jesus makes of his betrayal. Then betrayal accepted, the, the fact that this is permitted to happen. Uh, we'll then look right in the middle of the, the passage, and I think this is wonderful, that right in the, the center of such a pivotal passage, we see God is glorified. And then Jesus gives the disciples a, a new command. And then finally, kind of like bookends, we have a prediction on either end of the, the passage, passage, this prediction of Peter's denial. So a denial foretold. So I say it will be a very light touch. Um, just going through each of these, um, there'll hopefully be a, a key lesson from each, maybe a challenge as well, something we can try and take on board. But uh, yeah, not very much a, a light touch to, to try and get through all of these things within the next 15 minutes. So let's start with betrayal foretold. Very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. That is one of the 12 disciples who had been journeying with Jesus these last three years. One of the 12 disciples who had stood next to Jesus as Jesus performed incredible miracles. 
one of the 12 disciples who had stood beside Jesus as he had preached words of truth, love, and compassion with the power of the Messiah. The word betrayal is almost the opposite of faithfulness. It's uh, an act of infidelity. It's, it's uh, breaking bonds of trust. Consider for a moment that in the, the, the hours following what, what we're looking at in this passage, Jesus is about to experience significant anguish, physical pain, and torture at the hands of the Romans. That comes about because of a betrayal from a close friend, from a close disciple who's journeyed with him. It's, it's no wonder that we, we read in verse 21 that, that Jesus' spirit is troubled. The disciples are also troubled. This, this, this uh, atmosphere of confusion, I suppose, descends on them when Jesus tells them that betrayal is, is what's going to come. The, the disciples were, were shocked at this. We, we don't read in this particular account, but in the other Gospels, we, we read them asking, is it I? Tell me it's not me that betrays you. It might be obvious for us as we read the passage and as we read other parts of the, the gospel that, that Judas is the, the one who is the, the traitor. There's, there's obvious hints and pointers to his uh, lack of integrity throughout the gospels. And, and reading this passage, of course, we, we have the benefit of seeing that it's Judas. But for the, the disciples, that wasn't clear. There's, there's a, an air of confusion. And into that confusion... Jesus speaks words of assurance to these, these fragile disciples. These fragile disciples, because within a few hours, they're going to be scattered. They're going to have lost their master, and they're not going to know what to do. A fragile group of disciples, and into that, Jesus speaks words of assurance. The words of assurance that he speaks are these. I know those I chose. I know those who I chose might bring back memories of, of Jesus back in chapter 6 of John where he says, did not I choose to you twelve and one of you is a devil? You see, the disciples are, are shocked when this prediction of betrayal happens, but Jesus isn't. The, the powers of darkness are, are coming together to, to plot against Jesus. They're, they're using deceitful tactics to to use one, someone that's so close to Jesus, and yet Jesus is not deceived. He's not surprised. He's able to make this prediction because he knows the hearts of his disciples. He knows which one is going to deceive him. And this is an assurance because it shows that he is, he is aware and he is comfortable that God is in control. So that's, that's, the, that's the first point, the first key takeaway that we need to have. God is still in control. Even though it's, it seems like the, 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 the coming of the cross is a, is a tragedy, it's actually a triumph of redemption. Even though this betrayal might shake the disciples to their core, it's actually in line with God's plan. No matter the actions of, of sinful people, sinful people can never thwart God's plan. Jesus has trust that God's plan will see, see him through, even if that, in Jesus' case, means the suffering, the humiliation, and the death. So that's, that's key point number one. Yes, God is in, has a plan, Jesus predicts his death, tells his disciples to reassure them that I know who I chose, I know what's going on, and I still trust in God's plan. Okay, so we have a betrayal foretold, but we also have a betrayal accepted. Peter obviously wants answers. Peter asks John, who asks Jesus, and Jesus responds uh, using Psalm 41.9, in terms of dipping bread, and, uh, and he identifies it as Judas. Now, it's, it's not entirely clear who recognizes that 
what Jesus said in terms of dipping the bread and, and passing it on, uh, because it seems that the rest of the disciples don't quite fully appreciate that Judas is, is the traitor, though it's assumed that, that John, being told that, understands. And so Jesus identifies Judas as his betrayer. And at this point, we're told Satan enters Judas. There's a, a sense in which the, the restraint of evil that God has applied is withdrawn. It, it is a very dark image. In the presence of the Messiah, the Savior, Satan has entered Judas. So what does Jesus say? How does Jesus respond to this? Does he call him out? Is this a chance for him to thwart the devil's plan? I mean, he could draw attention to him in front of the 12 disciples and prevent Judas now from going out and permitting this perfidious deed. But he doesn't. He says the words that are on the screen. What you're about to do, do quickly. With that, the process which is going to bring about his death is initiated. This is the, the wheels in motion. What you're about to do, do quickly. He accepts that he will be betrayed. And he allows Judas to go through with his deed. Let's not pretend that this is easy for Jesus. We know later on that night that he's going to be in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's going to be asking God if there, there is another option, if there is another way for this to be taken from him. But not my will, but thy will be done. Jesus submits and is obedient to God. Key point number two. So yes, God is in control. Yes, God has a plan and Jesus trusted that. But Jesus was obedient to that plan. He was fully committed to bringing about God's salvation and redemption purposes. I guess it's a, a word of encouragement that we can see even the, with the foreknowledge of what's going to come that Jesus loved us so much to set these things in motion. There were so many ways in which he could have pulled out. So many human decisions where he, he didn't have to go through with it. And yet he did. And I don't think we can bypass that because that does speak to the love that he has for us and the, the, the extent of that. So key point two, Christ was obedient to, to God. And it's, it's maybe not entirely related, but uh, God's salvation plan, we ourselves, even today here in the 21st century, we have a commission to share the good news of that salvation plan. That's our role to play. And I wonder how obedient we are in responding to that commission. Now, of course, we, we don't obey in our own strength. The, the next chapter, chapter 14, and possibly this is something that Dave's going to talk about next week, we, we hear Jesus say to the disciples that God is going to provide an advocate for them to help them with their obedience. That is, that there's the Holy Spirit. But it just it struck me as I was reading this that, that, yes, we see Jesus being obedient to God's plan, but that should be also be an example for us to, to be obedient to his commands as well. And no, we don't do that on our own strength, but we need to pray for the Spirit to help us to renew our hearts so that we might point to Jesus in all his glory. Talking of glory, that brings us to the third point, that God is glorified in this passage. Verse 30, Judas leaves, and we're told it's night. I don't want to avoid the symbolism there that darkness is falling as Judas is leaving to do his, his evil deed. And yet, in spite of the darkness, Jesus proclaims that the Son of Man is glorified. Now, the Son of Man is glorified. And God is glorified in him. Why now? Why? My understanding is that, is that it comes down again to, to these wheels being set in motion, to this initiation of the process which is going to bring about his death. 
Jesus is glorified in his death. Because in his death, he is taking on the sin of the world. He's a sacrificial lamb, providing hope for the lost and forgiveness for the sinful people who recognize their weakness and turn to him. There is no act of man more worthy of glory than what Jesus accomplished at the cross. And it is glorious. And if you're here tonight and you're not a Christian and this is all quite new, then if you remember the first key point that God has a plan, that's, that's great. And if you remember the second point that, that Christ is obedient and, and we can emulate that, that's, that's even better. But if there's anything you, you want to leave here tonight with, then it's this truth of the cross and what it is that Jesus is offering us. Forgiveness from our sins and an invitation into his family when we recognize that we're in need of forgiveness. So in the middle of the passage, Jesus recognizes that something's changed. Judas has now left. The wheels are set in motion. His death is going to be brought about And now he can say the Son of Man is glorified and God is going to be glorified in him. And it's at this point that we we have, uh, that is the the third key point, really, just that God is glorified in Jesus' work at the cross, which brings us to our, our fourth point. Jesus moves on and talks a little bit now about a new command. He he tells them that he is leaving. This isn't new. They they've been told this before. He told it in the end of chapter 12. He's leaving, but he's giving them a new command. The new command is this. Love one another. As I have loved you, you must love one another. How is this new? Leviticus 19 tells people to to love their neighbor. Throughout the Bible, throughout the gospel, we have the command to to love one another. Yet Jesus says here, I have a new command. Well, again, my understanding is, is, is that we need to look at this in light of the cross, in light of these wheels being set in motion, this process leading towards the cross that's just been initiated here. Because in one sense, Jesus' death on the cross is him showing this, this, this new depth to his love for us. He's he's giving up his life for those he loves, for for those who will accept him. That's that's a a new standard by which we're measuring this love one another. It's a a new example which gives a a whole new set of of limits and boundaries to, to, or removes the limits and boundaries rather to what we might think is love. So that's one way, but maybe the second way is to do with the, the fact that the cross provides, provides the freedom for us to, to have that love and that obedience through the Holy Spirit. Maybe I didn't word that very well. But the, there's, there's maybe new power in this command in light of what Jesus is going to do at the cross. Because in the, what Jesus does at the cross, we are free, free to love, free to obey, free to, free to treasure the things of God. We have freedom in our new creation, which we're welcomed into because of what Jesus establishes at the cross. So either way, this, this new command to love means that when we, we love one another, and when that's an instruction that we, we as a church take seriously, we need to do so in light of the cross and in light of what Jesus did for us there. But he doesn't just say that we need to love one another. He says that that's how we should be recognized as his disciples. So that is the, the key point, if you like. We should love one another and let that be the the defining trait, the defining characteristic of his church. I've got a couple of friends who are definitely atheists. There was a time when they were agnostic and they've, they've said to me they're now atheist, but uh, they both grew up in Christian families and, and both said to me recently when I met them over Christmas that they just 
they love hanging around Christians. It's like they, and I don't mean me, I don't think that's, uh, <laughs> I got the impression they were talking about other people. Um, but I, but they, logically they're, they're thinking there's something that's, that's stopping them from, from taking that act of faith. But they recognize that there is something good. They recognize there's something, something selfless in the love that they've seen in their experience with Christians. And I was really encouraged to hear that, but also challenged in thinking, well, well I, I need to, to make sure that, that I'm representing Christ well. And I need to make sure that I pray that, that I do be a good ambassador for Christ. Because people do notice and then people do look, but I think that's a wonderful way for people to recognize us. If people recognize KBC as a church that loved each other, loved each other in the way that Jesus did, which was a sacrificial, servant-hearted love. Key point number four. And that brings us to the, the final part of the passage. I'd say it was going to be quite quick trying to get through it all. This is the, the final prediction, the, the prediction of Peter's denial. Now, you might have recognized the glory of the cross and you might have endeavored to love one another as Jesus loved. But like Peter and like the other disciples this night, and like me, and I'm sure like everyone else here, we know we've fallen short. Jesus warns Peter, he says, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter says, I'll lay down my life for you. But what Peter says in words, Jesus actually completes in actions. Rob talked to us last week through Peter's denial in a bit more detail and, and mentioned the fact that there was grace for Peter, there was forgiveness for Peter. Peter, when anointed by the Holy Spirit, went on to, to build and establish the church. And yet, I don't think it's right for us to, to pass by this, this description of, of Peter's denial without reflecting on our, our own challenges when it comes to talking about Jesus. Obviously, that courtyard was a hostile environment for, for Peter. He felt pressured and didn't want to admit his knowing Jesus. And, uh, and obviously, with the the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that came after Pentecost and the way he would have dealt with that probably would have changed, but I don't think that gets around the fact that we all find ourselves probably in environments where it's very difficult to talk about Jesus. Maybe it's hostile, or maybe it's just going to be a bit awkward or potentially embarrassing. I wonder if we just need to take this challenge from what we see of, of Peter denying Jesus three times and just reflect a little bit to, to make sure that maybe, maybe it's not that we deny Jesus. Maybe it's not that we lie about our faith. But maybe it's that we don't use every opportunity that we have to talk about it. That we're maybe quiet about it when we really should say something. When there's an opportunity to to give an encouraging word and, and share what we've read in, in our Bible that morning that's encouraged and strengthened us. I know I certainly miss a lot of opportunities I, I could really make, make more use of. And so I thought it'd be a helpful thing for us to maybe consider tonight whether there's, yeah, whether we could pray for more opportunities or recognize those opportunities to, to share the gospel. So point five, can we talk about Jesus more? I think for me, the answer is yes. So it was a whistle-stop tour. Those were the, the five different sections of the, the passage that we worked through. Uh, but I think it is a significant component of this journey to the cross. You know, it's a journey which is facilitated by betrayal. It's a journey that's unsupported by friends. Jesus is abandoned by his disciples in a matter of hours. 
And yet in spite of that, the plan of God comes together. Jesus, obediently submitting to it, becomes that sacrificial lamb, glorifies himself and glorifies God and provides a way in which we can be saved. So it is a really good news story, but there's so much to it. And as Rob was saying earlier, the the plan is to to have a little bit more of a a time to reflect at the end. And so I'm going to close in prayer, but I'm going to leave those points up on the the screen so that maybe you can have a chat with the the person next to you about it. Maybe you can take some time in, in prayer and reflection on that. And there will be a prayer ministry team as well, so if there's something you need prayer for, or if you just want to talk about what God's word has said tonight, then there'll be an opportunity for that. Let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We praise you, Lord, that you're in control in the midst of dark times. When we're deceived and unforeseen events rock our lives, thank you that we can cling to your promises and know that your plans are good. Thank you for Jesus' example of obedience. Help us, I pray, through your Holy Spirit to work powerfully in our lives that we may have hearts and minds that yearn to keep your commands. Lord, we praise you for the glorious work of the cross and all that you achieved in those dark hours for those you loved. Keep us rooted in your truth and help us to love one another such that people will recognize you in our interactions. We pray that you you keep us away from the temptation to stay quiet about our faith. Plant in us a, a spirit of boldness that we might proclaim your gospel and that your light may shine in the darkness and glory be known by all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.